When I talk to people that don't know what TCP IP is all about, don't know what IPv6 is all about, I talk about what are their expectations. They expect everything to just work correctly, pervasively, and always. They expect to have multiple personas on the network. They expect to move around with their information and to have relevant data when they need to. That assumption implies an infrastructure that is robust, scalable, efficient, and pervasive. IPv4 is the protocol that's used today and has made the internet a success. But IP version 4, unfortunately, has a limit in it. Its limit is a 32-bit limit. 32 bits turns out to be approximately 4.3 billion devices, which sounds like a lot of devices, but remember the planet has some 7 billion people on it. It used to be when you went on the internet, you might have a single address for your computer. Now you've got several phones in your house. If you have a family with children, you might have a couple of video games. We've got security systems. We've got video monitors. You've got network streaming. All of those things are internet enabled now, and they all need an address. Those things are exploding the, the growth of the internet and the number of IP addresses that are required. If we do it right as an industry, uh, we can not only uh, prevent the slowdown of innovation in the internet, we can actually accelerate it because we've removed the limitations that we've had to endure with the existing version of IP. And IPv6 really opens up uh, the capabilities and allows us to continue innovating, but even at a faster accelerated pace. The really exciting part of it is the new types of devices that are now able to communicate. Things that you've never thought about before are able to talk to each other. So, for example, if we go back to your home environment and your refrigerator is now able to communicate with a grocery store and be able to pass along information, or you're starting to see more vendors be able to offer support plans for their equipment and their appliances, and the communication happens automatically and it all happens across this new environment. It's only possible because they're going to this broader addressing scheme. Well, in the very early stages, I think the most important things as an enterprise, when you're looking at deploying IPv6, is making sure that the services that you run visible to everyone else outside of your organization are available over the IPv6 network. There's unfortunately kind of a head in the sand attitude among some organizations in North America at IPv6. You don't live in a vacuum, you live in, in you know, any number of different ecosystems consisting of you know, business partners and customers and uh, consultants you work with and all of these people, you know, live around the world and some of them may be moving to IPv6 and that may force you to do the same. You don't need to move your entire IP infrastructure over to v6, but you need to start planning and thinking about v6 today. And really what we talk about is moving your public facing services, those services you've used to communicate with the outside world. We're talking about web services, email, DNS, or any of the other services that you use to communicate with your customers, partners, or vendors. For a lot of organizations, this represents a chance to start fresh, to really have a clean slate, to begin planning their network so they can better prepare. There are some interesting anecdotes, especially on the Microsoft side. There's, there's some, um, because of, uh, of what Microsoft did with the introduction of Windows Vista making, and uh, Server 2008, and making IPv6 on by default, and uh, the preferred protocol out of the two, there are a tremendous number of enterprises that have no idea that they're actually running IPv6 in their network. Well, I think the eye-opener for many people when they when they talk about v6 and saying, well, you know, this is our plan to deploy it. And I say, no, if you're running Server, Server 2008 R2 and you're running Windows 7, you already deployed it. You just didn't do it in a fashion that you thought you should have. They're already using IPv6 and they don't know it. So I deal with a lot of security issues, especially regarding IPv6, that if they're not looking to deploy it, it's actually happening already in their network, whether they're, you know, they have hosts that are tunneling out, whether they have router advertisements, neighbor solicitations, all the stuff that's happening in this chatter of v6 on the network that they may not be using, but it's there and kind of opening up for some sort of a, you know, of an attack. What we are learning um, as active adopters of V6, that there are a number of possible operational benefits. What I mean by that is, is how we can leverage V6 to make our lives simpler, how we can run the networks more efficiently. Um, that, that's, that's a very key point. There's some features built into the protocol which actually allow you to eliminate for example, many of the engineering cycles 
that were required in the old protocol, you can totally jump over that step and it helps with rapid provisioning as an example. So there's all kinds of new opportunity because of some of the features that are baked into the protocol that we're now afforded as we move into the future. That, that lack of interoperability can be perceived as a challenge. In reality, it can be a blessing because you can run the two protocols side by side, ships in the night, which enables you to take a whole new perspective on how you want to deploy the protocol compared to what you have in place today. But you can do that without disturbing what you have in place today. That is a huge opportunity. We are not going to have this opportunity again for many, many, many years because we have a very big investment in our current infrastructure. We have services that we cannot take down. So this ability to create an overlay and create our next generation on top of what we have today, it's truly the unique opportunity that we all have to focus on and take advantage of it. Anytime you're creating those procurements and you're doing your procurements, make sure your hardware and software are IPv6 enabled. That's going to save you money in the long run because you can do it in your normal hardware refresh cycles instead of as a bulk forklift upgrade. It is imperative that people who test products that are destined for a production environment, that they test them in a way that they're going to be used, right? Testing them in some fabricated, convoluted manner doesn't, doesn't help anybody, right? So it is very important that, 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 that the engineering and the technical side of a corporation is, has a clear, uh, proper relationship with the procurement so that as, as, as devices or equipment are, are sold into an enterprise or a service provider network, that they satisfy the company's V6 requirements. Look very, very carefully in your RFP process and ask very specific questions about features that you need with IPv6. And where vendors aren't supporting those, we recommend you need to challenge those vendors for roadmaps for future support in IPv6. You have to remember that vendors, whether they are product or services, are still coming up to speed. They are still on this process of understanding and getting ready for IPv6. And that means that products might have issues that you want to make sure that you uh, filter out as much as possible in your procurement process. Break up your programs into you know, incremental bite-sized chunks. Um, deploy where you need it the most first and put a proper plan in place for V6 everywhere later. Start your journey now. The reality is such we're going to be in two internets. You're going to have the IPv4 based internet and the IPv6 based internet. You cannot afford not to be present on the IPv6 internet. No action will lead to isolation and you're going to be passed by.